I think we could say that the currency of life is time. The currency of our lives is measured in time. And as we get older, we become a bit more sensitive to the passing of time. There's so many things to do and so little time in which to do them. This is a lesson that is often lost on the young. And therefore, it can be very puzzling why we were created, why did God create us in such a way that we spend about 25 to 30 percent of our lives sleeping? Wouldn't it have been much more effective to create human beings that could be made like those premium cell phone chargers that you can get charged in one half the time or even less than that? It seems like all the time that we spend sleeping and dreaming really doesn't allow us to fulfill our true destinies. We could be using that time so much more productively. In the 28th chapter of the book of Genesis in Bereshit, we have the very famous story of Jacob's dream of the ladder that he sees reaching up to the heavens and the angels going up and down on the ladder. And then he proclaims when he wakes up something very amazing. He says, indeed, Achain, God is in this place and I didn't know. He says, God is in this place and I didn't know. It's actually an entire book written by Lawrence Kushner on this one verse, because when you read the Hebrew, it's a bit redundant. He says, Ani lo yadati, and I, I didn't know. The word ani seems not to belong there. But what does it mean when he wakes up and he says, indeed, or behold, God was in this place, and I didn't know? Some of the Hasidic commentaries to the Torah explain that Jacob had just come from the yeshiva of Shem and Aver. He was learning Torah in the yeshiva of Shem and Aver. If you ever go to Tzvat, you can go pray in the synagogue of Shem and Aver. And the rabbis teach that for 22 years that he was studying there, he never went to sleep. Because Jacob thought that sleeping was a waste of time. So he managed, like some yogi from India, to stay up for those 22 years. And now for the first time in 22 years, he goes to sleep. Imagine what it must have felt like when he woke up in the morning. And he screams out, God is in this place, and I never knew it. And the Hasidic commentaries explain that he recognizes, he realizes now, oh, God was in this place, meaning of sleep. That God can, can be somehow connected to sleep, and I never knew that. He says, I never knew that sleep could be spiritual. I always thought that it was just a waste of time. Scientists estimate that we spend about six years of our lives dreaming. Depends, I guess, how long we're going to live. Approximately 20, 25 years of our lives sleeping. And what we try, what we'll try to explore tonight are some Jewish views on the significance of these activities. You know, in English, when we use the word dream and a dreamer, it has several connotations. We speak about someone as a dreamer, and we imagine someone who's often out of touch with reality, a luftmensch, we might say in Yiddish, a flake. But that's it, he's a dreamer. And then sometimes we use the word dreamer to discuss, describe someone who's a visionary, a person that's inspired and a person who aspires to accomplishing noble things in their life. We're going to see that in Jewish literature, there's also a number of different ways in which dreaming is viewed. The wisest man who ever lived, Solomon Shlomo HaMelech, wrote in Koheles in his book Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, verse 2, Ki bo ha-chalom berov inyan. He says that dreams come from our daily concerns and preoccupations. That's basically all the dreams are. Whatever you were worried about during the day, whatever you were thinking about during the day, whatever preoccupied you 
That's what you're going to dream about. The rabbis teach in Talmud Brachot 55b that Shmuel Bar Nachmani said in the name of Rabbi Yonasan, Ein marin lo adam ela mehurhei halei, mehurhei libo, that a person is only shown their own thoughts. And Rashi explains that basically dreams are an amalgam of images from what a person is thinking about during their waking hours. So it seems that according to these sources, dreams are not really that spiritually significant. The Talmud in Brachot tells of two great sages, Abaye and Rava, that each had the same dream, and they took this dream to a dream interpreter, and they each received different interpretations for the same dream, because one of them had paid the interpreter, and one of them didn't pay the interpreter. And yet, even though they received different interpretations to the same dream, we're told that both of the dreams were fulfilled. And the Talmud famously says the reason is because all dreams follow the mouth. Every dream follows its interpretation. So it seems that what the Talmud is saying is the dream itself is not that significant. What's significant is how we spin the dream, how we frame it, how we interpret it. And the truth is, in Jewish law, the rabbis consistently have taught that dreams have no bearing on Jewish law. There's a famous story that's quoted in several places about someone who was upset because they didn't know where their father had placed a sum of money that was used for Maaser Sheni. In the times of the temple, there was a tax system where a person would give usually about 2% of their produce went to the priests, and then the next 10% of their produce went to the Levites, and then there was a seven-year cycle where in the first and second and fourth and fifth years of that second-year cycle, you had something called the second tithe, the Maser Sheni. And the law was that you had to take that produce and bring it to Jerusalem and eat it in Jerusalem. Now, if you didn't want to schlep all that produce from where you were living to Jerusalem, you could redeem that produce for money and then take the cash and spend the cash in Jerusalem. So this fellow knew that his father had this money that had redeemed the second tithe, and he didn't know where it was. So the Talmud tells that someone came to him in a dream and told him exactly where this money was, exactly how much money there was, and that this was Maser Sheni, meaning this was consecrated money. It wasn't money that belonged to him. This was already consecrated to be used in a holy way. And it turned out that when he went to this place, the money, the exact amount of money, was in that very place. And when he went to the rabbis to discuss the situation, they said, the money belongs to you. It has no holy significance whatsoever because we don't place any legal significance on dreams. We say that halomos dreams, lo ma'alin velo yordim. They don't have any significance. So the fact that someone came to you in a dream and told you that this money you're going to find is maser sheni, we don't believe what the dream said. You found the money, mazel tov, you're very lucky. So we see here that dreams don't seem to be very significant from a Jewish perspective. However, as Tevye would say, but on the other hand, <laughs> we have a boatload of sources which seem to say the exact opposite. For example, the tractate Brachot, Talmud Brachot 57b tells us there are five things that are a 60th of something else. There are five things that are a 60th of another thing. So for example, fire is a 60th of Gehenna. Right? So if you put your hand into your stove fire, that's a 60th of what burning in hell will feel like. Honey is a 60th of manna. So if you want to know how delicious the manna was that we ate in the desert, it's a 60th, of our honey is a 60th as delicious as the manna. Shabbat is a 60th of the world to come. So however delicious Shabbat is, the world to come is 60 times greater. 
sleep is a 60th of death, and a dream is a 60th of prophecy. So here the Talmud is saying that a dream is not insignificant. A dream has some prophetic significance. And the Midrash Rabbah, the Breshit 17.5 says that dreams are undeveloped or unripe fruit of prophecy. Meaning that dreams are very, very close to being a prophecy. And therefore dreams, according to these sources, seem highly significant. The commentary to the Bible, the Balaturim points out, the Genesis 28.12, that the word chalom, dream, has the same numerical value as zeh ben This comes in prophecy. And some people have pointed out very fascinatingly that the word, the, the root of the root, the root of dream, chet lamed mem, the root letters, chet lamed mem, appear 48 times in the book of Genesis and seven times in the other books of the five books of Moses. Now, why would these two numbers be significant? 48 times in Genesis, seven times in the other books of the five books of Moses, because the tractate, the Talmud tractate Megillah 14a points out that there were 48 male prophets that we had as a Jewish people and seven female prophets. So we see again, there's a connection between this idea of dreaming and prophecy. Of course, we all know that in the book of Breshit, in Genesis, that is the headquarters for dreams in the Bible. As a matter of fact, almost all the biblical dreams are found in Genesis. There are 10 dream stories there. And these are extremely pivotal moments in Jewish history. So for example, in Genesis chapter 20, God appears to Avimelech in a dream. Avimelech has just kidnapped Abraham's wife, Sarah. And God tells him in the dream, you're to return Sarah to her husband, Abraham. Later in Genesis chapter 31, God comes to Lavan. Lavan is furious with Jacob. He's upset that Jacob, he thinks, has ripped him off. And he is running after Jacob to do him some kind of harm. So God appears to Lavan in a dream and says, don't touch a hair on Jacob's head. The Gemara in Chagiga, Talmud Chagiga 5b, tells us that today we don't have any more prophecy. However, God reveals himself to us in dreams. So today, even though we don't have prophets, God reveals himself to us in dreams. It seems from these sources that dreams are highly significant. As a matter of fact, there are numerous stories in our rabbinic literature that rabbis based some of their halachic rulings on dreams. I'll share with you one very famous example. Rabbeinu Ephraim of Regensburg, who was one of the Balei Atosifo, who lived about 800 years ago, permitted a very controversial fish called the burbita. Some people think it might be the sturgeon. It's not clear exactly what kind of fish it was, but it was a very controversial fish. That night, he has a dream, and in the dream, someone comes to him with a plate full of shrutzen, creepy, crawly insects, and offers him that he should eat these insects. And in the dream, Rabbi Ephraim is indignant and angry and says, you're offering me these insects to eat? That's disgusting. What kind of a chutzpah do you have? So the person says to him, you're the person you yourself permitted these insects. He woke up from his dream realizing that this dream was a message that he should not have permitted this fish. He immediately retracted his ruling, he rescinded it. So we see here that based upon a dream, one of our great rabbis actually changed the halachic ruling. So how do we deal with the fact that so many of our sources seem to take a different approach about the significance and reliability of dreams. One of our great sages, Rav Isaac Yitzhak Abarbanel, who was a 15th century Spanish statesman, financier, and Torah scholar, and other scholars like Rabbi Bachia suggested that way we resolve this contradiction, or these seeming contradictions, is by realizing there are actually different kinds of dreams. And basically, we find in the literature three kinds of dreams. Number one 
are dreams that are primarily affected by physical stimuli, by the foods we eat, by the climate, by our consumption of alcohol, by the state of our health. And these dreams, our literature tells us, are totally meaningless and insignificant. They have no spiritual significance whatsoever. I found out a few years ago, I was taking a medita medication, and the doctor told me that one of the side effects of this medication is very vivid and bizarre dreams, which is true. Every night, I sort of lay back and I watch these amazing shows behind my eyelids, and they're totally caused by the drugs I'm taking. So those dreams, which are a function of physical stimuli, our literature says don't have any real spiritual significance. Then the second kind of dream, as we mentioned before, are dreams which basically are a continuation of the thoughts and experiences we've had during the daytime. The Talmud in Tractate Brachot 56a tells a pair of very cute stories. In one of them, the Caesar once came to Rabbi Yeshua ben Hananya and said, you Jews are supposed to be very clever people. So tell me, what am I going to dream about tonight when I sleep? So the rabbi said to him, you're going to see the Persians conquering you and forcing you to pasture pigs with a golden staff. Well, the whole day the Caesar thought about this, and of course he saw it in his dream that night as well. However, there are dreams that are the product of real spiritual experiences that are rooted in our souls. And they're rooted in our souls having some kind of access to the spiritual realms in the upper worlds. The Talmud tells us in Tractate Brachot, again, many of these passages in the Talmud are from the Tractate Brachot 55b, where Rava posed a contradiction between two biblical verses. One was a verse we read last week on Shabbat in the Torah portion, Baalosacha, from Numbers chapter 12, verse 6, where God says that Moses is different from all other prophets. To Moses, I speak face to face. There's no real distortion in the message I'm giving to Moses. But God says, but to other prophets, I will speak to in a dream. That's Numbers 12, 6. And it says, in a dream, I will speak with him. Maimonides explains in his Guide to the Perplexed that that's essentially how all prophets other than Moses receive their prophecy through a dream or through a vision. So here we see a verse which says that prophecy comes through dreams. However, Rabbah said we have another verse in the Bible, the prophet Zechariah chapter 12 verse 2, which says dreams speak lies. So in the Talmud, Rava poses these two verses against each other and says, what's going on? Are dreams a form of prophecy or are dreams lies? So Rava says there's no contradiction. One passage is referring to a dream coming through the agency of an angel, but the other passage is referring to a dream that comes through the agency of a demon or from the darker spiritual forces. Now, it's very, very important to understand that there is a range of spiritual experiences in this third type of dream. When we speak about a third type of dream, which is basically a form of prophecy, there is a range of what we mean by this. It goes all the way from direct, real, full-blown prophecy to a more diffuse form of enlightenment that the rabbis say is a 60th of prophecy. So it's not what you'd call a full-blown prophecy. It has, we say, zekemo prophecy, as we say in Hebrew, right? Zekein, it's like, it's, it's like prophecy. It's prophetic, but it's not true prophecy. Now, how does this work? So our Kabbalistic literature describes there are five levels to our souls. Our souls are not completely singular in how they're made up. There are five levels to each human soul. The first level is called the nefesh, and the nefesh is the part of our soul that's the animating force. And we have it in common with animals. Animals as well 
have a nefesh because it basically keeps them alive. And then there's the ruach, the spirit, which the rabbis say basically corresponds to our emotional makeup, our emotional realm. Then there's the neshama, which we call the soul, but that's our spiritual side. And then there are the upper two levels of our soul that are very ethereal, called the chaya and yechida, which basically are the more transcendent aspects to our soul. So Rav Moshe Chaim Mutsato, the Ramchal, in his famous book, The Derech Hashem, The Way of God, explains that when we sleep, our nefesh, the lowest part of our soul, stays connected to the body in order to keep it alive. However, the higher parts of our soul ascend to their heavenly root, their heavenly source, to get recharged. That's what happens at night when we're sleeping. Now, from the perspective of the body, from our body's perspective, sleep is like a 60th of death, right? The body says, who needs it? I'd rather be doing other things. It's a waste of time. So from the perspective of our body, sleep seems like death. And so the Talmud says sleep is a 60th of death. However, from the perspective of our souls, it's a chance for the soul to get much needed nourishment. So it's true, we do sleep for about a third of our lives, but it's not a waste of time because we're created in the image of God and therefore we need more to sustain us than what our stomachs ingest. Now, while our soul is in this out-of-body experience, it has access to things that it doesn't have access to in its waking state in the physical world. For example, our soul in this disembodied state is able to meet up with other disembodied souls, especially people that are close to you, loved ones. Or the soul is able to receive divine revelations that can help us avoid danger or could teach us how to grow spiritually. It's also important to remember that the soul is able to have experiences with negative spiritual forces. And those usually result in what we call ominous or bad dreams. Now, it's very important to understand that our ability to access usefully these dreams depends on our spiritual level. And not every person in the world is the same. What is critical, the critical factor is how much we've refined our bodies and how much we've refined ourselves. I'll give you an example. Our rabbis teach, as I'll teach, that when a righteous person dies, the separation of their soul from their body is like removing a hair from a bowl of milk. Because the soul of a righteous person is not overly attached to their body. A spiritual person doesn't primarily identify as a body. They see themselves as a soul. So because the righteous person, the spiritual person, doesn't get overly engaged, overly involved, overly attached to their bodies, so when they die and their soul leaves, it's like a piece of hair being removed from a bowl of milk. But the Talmud says, when a less refined, they use the example of a wicked person dies, they say removing their soul from their body is like taking a tuft of wool out of a thicket of thorns. Not so easy. So a true prophet, our literature says, is someone that's reached a very high level of personal perfection where their bodies are properly synced to their souls. And therefore, their bodies serve as a virtually transparent or translucent interface to the next world. There's very little interference between their body and the next world and the soul world. Their dreams will be devoid of useless, confusing information. However, for people whose minds and bodies are usually devoid and not tuned into the spiritual at all, so most of their dreams will be a confusing jumble of nonsensical images and events. 
So the Abarvanel, again, we quoted before, says there are two ways to identify a true prophecy versus a false dream. A true dream versus a false dream. Number one, he says that true dreams are straightforward, they are ordered, and they're not chaotic. They don't contain lots of irrelevant information. And secondly, true dreams leave a deep impression on our souls. True dreams basically speak to us, and we have an intuitive sense that we are being given a message from the upper realms. We have sort of an intuitive way of knowing that what we're getting is significant. Now, our literature has literally thousands of dream stories. Thousands of dream stories. I'll share a few with you tonight. About 800 years ago, there was a great Torah scholar named Rav Maimon, and he chose to remain single for many years because he wanted to devote himself exclusively to studying of Torah. One night he had a dream, and in the dream he was told that he was to visit a certain town, and he was to marry the daughter of the butcher who was named Yom Tov. Well, he woke up and he totally dismissed this dream. But the dream came back the next night. And again, he said, ah, it's baloney, such a dream. He dismissed it again. But this dream kept on coming back to him. You have to go to this city. You have to marry the daughter of the butcher named Yom Tov. And it finally happened one too many times. He realized he cannot ignore the dream. So he picked himself up. He traveled to this city. He found the butcher named Yom Tov. He asked him if he could marry his daughter, which they did. She gave birth shortly afterward to a son they named Moshe, who became the future Moses ben Maimon, Maimonides. Now, I personally met someone who had a very similar experience. Before I moved to Canada, I had a Shabbat meal with the person who is written about in a story that you can find in the book called Small Miracles by Halberstam and Leventhal. And in this story, the names are all changed, but I actually met the person who was the real life person. So the story says that Deborah Robinson was dating a man named Ed Wilson back in 1991. They had been dating for three years. And Ed had proposed to her several times, but she was very fearful of tying the knot, and she kept on basically keeping him, uh, you know, postponing it and pushing him off. But she never felt good about it. She felt miserable because she felt lonely, and she felt unsettled about pushing him off. Anyway, one night, her father, Wayne Robinson, who had died 10 years earlier, came to his old friend, Chuck Anton in a dream. And he told his friend Chuck, you've got to do me a favor. You've got to tell my daughter that the man she is seeing is her destined one and that she has to marry him. Well, Chuck woke up in the morning, totally freaked out that his old friend he hadn't seen in 10 years came to him in a dream. He tells his wife what happened. His wife says, ah, it's baloney, go back to sleep. So he did, he went back to sleep. A week later, his friend, Wayne, Wayne Robinson, comes to him a second time and says, why didn't you do what I asked you to do? And now he woke up and he was really freaked out, so he went to speak to his priest. And his priest says to him, listen, why don't you find this woman? If she's not dating anyone, then forget about the whole thing. But if she's seeing someone, you have a responsibility to tell this woman about the dream. The following Sunday, we're told that Deborah was lying in her bed and weeping. Why was she weeping? Because the night before, her younger sister had gotten engaged. And while she was thrilled for her younger sister, it brought up her own feelings of loneliness. And she began crying to God, God, please help me. Help me figure out what to do. I beg of you, please give me a sign. At that very moment, the phone rings. Three months later, Deborah and Ed were married and have been living a fairy tale life. 
There's a book called The Visions of Greatness, written by Rabbi Yosef Weiss. He tells a story which is very local here in Toronto. You know that Toronto built an A roof, a border around the city, around at least parts of the Jewish community, that allow us to carry things on the Sabbath. It becomes like an enclosed area. And to build the Toronto A roof, they needed to use parts of the CN railroad track areas. But they discovered that many of these railroad tracks were not enclosed by fences. And they needed these fences to build the A roof. So they met with the A roof committee, met with CN Railroad, and the railroad company allowed the repairs to be made to these fences. And they actually promised a large sum of money to help with the repairs. CN also appointed a senior management person to help oversee the repairs to 32 miles of track. Now this was a non, this person happened to be a non-observant Jew, but he put in an incredible amount of work and effort to see to it that this project became a success. He even called in some very big favors to get the job done. Now the Arif committee met with him one day and they said, you know, we're a little bit surprised that you seem to be literally going overboard on this project, what's going on? So he explained to them that he had a grandfather who was born in Kelm, who was a very religious man. And he said, my grandfather came to me in a dream and he told me you were put on this earth to help build the Aruv in Toronto. When the Aruv was finally completed, the Aruv committee chairperson called up this fellow's home to thank him. His wife answered the phone and says, you can't thank him, he just passed away. <clears throat> In the 13th century, Rabbi Yaakov Halevi of Marvej, I think that's how it's pronounced in France, authored a very unusual collection of responsa literature where he had posed questions to a dream angel before going to sleep. When he had certain questions, he would make inquiries of the dream angel, and he would receive answers while he was sleeping. He received 89 responses to his questions, and they're published in a book, you can find this book in libraries, called She'elot v'tshuvot min hashamayim, Questions and Answers from Heaven. And they're mainly questions and answers dealing with various issues in Jewish law. However, I'm going to share with you one of the side issues that was raised, a very strange but unusual question that he asked of his dream angel. He asked, are there any hints in the Jewish Bible to Jesus and Mary? Well, he woke up in the morning and he had been given a phrase from the Bible the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 31, verse 16, and he was shown the phrase, Elohe Nechar Haaretz, the false or strange gods of the earth. And it turns out that the numerical value, if you take the numerical value of each of these letters, it comes out to 606, which is the exact numerical value of Yeshu and Miriam, Jesus and Mary. I have with me a book here by the famous Hasidic master of Tzadok HaKohen of Lublin. He died in the year 1900. And he has a book here called Kuntris Divrei Chalomot. It's a book of his dreams, dozens and dozens of dreams where he received Torah messages and Torah thoughts while he was sleeping at night in his dreams. I actually had a story myself in 1980. When I came back from Israel, I went directly to Venice, California, where I was leading a Shabbaton. And I had not had a lot of time to prepare the talk I was going to give on the next day, Shabbat day. And there were no beds for us to sleep in. We had to actually sleep on the, the pews of the synagogue. And I didn't have a very restful sleep. But while I was sleeping, 
in my sleep, a very amazing idea came to me in my mind. It was the Shabbat that was speaking about the sin of Moses when he hits the rock instead of speaking to the rock. The Jews are thirsty, they want water, and God says to Moses, take your staff and speak to the rock. And Moses takes his staff and he hits the rock. And the water comes out, but God is very upset and says, because you disobeyed me, you're not going into the land of Israel. And Rashi basically explains that his sin was disobeying God. God said, speak to the rock, and he takes his staff, and he gives the rock a zetz. He smacks the rock. So that's why he's punished. But the Ramban, Nachmanides, says, what is he talking about, Rashi? God had told him to take his staff. And Nachmani says, whenever Moses was told to take his staff, it was for the purpose of zetzing, of, of hitting. So Nachmani says he didn't do anything wrong by hitting the rock with the staff. That's a famous debate between Nachmanides and Rashi. I'm sleeping, and in my sleep, I'm thinking about, is that really true? Did Moses actually hit every time he was told to take the staff? So the truth is, no. There were three times when he actually hit with the staff, but three times he didn't hit. He just held it up in the air. So, for example, when he turns the staff into a snake, he smacks the staff on the ground. When the Nile River produces, turns to blood, he hits the Nile, or Aaron hits the Nile with the staff. When they have the lice coming out of the sand, they smacked the sand with the staff. So those are times when they actually gave a clap with the staff. But when they had the frogs come out of the Nile, they didn't hit the water. They just held the staff above the water. When the locusts came out of the sky, they just held the staff in the sky. For the hail, they just hold the staff. So what came to me in my sleep was the difference is very clear. When you had to produce something that didn't normally exist in nature, there's not normally a snake in the staff. There's not normally blood in the water. There's not normally lice in the sand. So when you have to produce something that doesn't normally exist, you've got a hit. But when the thing exists in potentia, and you're just bringing it from the potential to the actual, you don't need to hit, you just hold it. So there are frogs in the Nile. There could be hail in the sky. There could be locusts in the sky. So this thought, which I never thought of in my waking days, comes to me while I'm sleeping. Rabbi Eliyahu Dessler, who's one of our great Bali Musar, tells us that some dreams come to us to reveal aspects of our personalities that would otherwise be hidden to us. So the question is, if we're supposed to be learning about ourselves, and how to improve. Why does God communicate in a dream? Why use a dream to do this? So one of the great Balei Musar who passed away a few years ago of Shlomo Volbi writes that if a person was to encounter, if a person was to see clearly all of their personal flaws, even some of them, it would be like going to hell alive. For you to directly be confronted with and see a deep flaw in your personality is extremely painful. So in order for God to make us aware of things that we need to deal with, the process has to be very subtle. Where a person has to come to realize by themselves, without being confronted too directly, the problem that needs to be fixed. fixed. So what is the great benefit of a dream? A dream is often filled with nonsensical information. A dream can be very strange and bizarre. So what you see in the dream about yourself might be disturbing, but you can always wake up and say, ah, it's only a dream. It allows you to take a little bit of the pressure off of yourself because you're not being confronted head on. But the point of the story has a way of penetrating our psychic armor because it's not a full force frontal confrontation. By the way, Rav Dessler also points out that sometimes what dreams help us to see are strong po positive parts of our personality also that we may not be aware of. 
Now, I should tell you that there is a massive literature on dream interpretation in Jewish sources. And it would require a complete separate lecture, which we don't have time for tonight. There's a famous book, for example, called the Sefer Pitre Chalamot by Shlomo Almoli, written in the year 1515, which was even quoted by Sigmund Freud. And he goes through a very, very comprehensive approach to Jewish dream interpretation. The Talmud has several pages that deal specifically with dream interpretation. And there's, again, a vast literature that we don't have time to analyze tonight, perhaps for another evening. What I'd like to conclude with tonight is one final idea that is discussed by Rabbi Akiva Tatz. We know that we were created from the earth of the ground. That's how human beings were made. God took the earth of the ground and formed it into a human being. But we have a spiritual side as well because God breathed the breath of life into us. But we are so dramatically tethered to our bodies and to this physical world that it becomes very difficult for us to grasp the idea that everything that we see and experience in this world simply reflects and is rooted in a much deeper spiritual reality. The world we're living in is not the real world. Anyone who saw the film The Matrix remembers the idea that the world that was projected onto virtual reality was not the real world. There was a real root to everything that was there. So everything in our little world, every single thing in our little world is but a pale reflection of its ultimate analog in the spiritual realms above. Somewhat like Plato's idea of the ideal. For example, our holy temple in Jerusalem was just the visible projection of its true source in a heavenly Jerusalem. But how do we get in touch with this idea that what seems so real to us and so solid is merely an illusion compared to its ultimate reality? The world that we see only reflects a true reality. The Bible says so many times, Ein od milvado. Really, there's nothing that truly exists other than God. Everything that exists in the world has an existence which doesn't have to be. None of this that we see has to be. Only one reality has to be. Because only reality truly is, and that's God himself. So how do we get in touch with this reality? How do we get in touch with this idea that seems so hard for us? Because again, we are so in, almost overwhelmed by our bodies. We're, so mo we're overwhelmed by the physical world we live in. It takes us over. So Rabbi Akiva Tatz tells us that that's where dreams come in. That's the great, beautiful benefit of dreams. He says that dreams can seem very real. You can actually be terrified during a dream. And then you wake up in the morning and realize oh, it was just a dream. It was just a dream. So again, it's hard for us to believe that our world is not real. It's hard to believe that our world isn't real. It seems so real. The pleasures that we experience in this world seem real. They seem real to us here, but all the pleasures in this world are merely pointing to ultimate, true pleasures that we will sometime exist in the future. It's hard for us to hear this idea. It's hard for us to believe that everything we experience here is an illusion compared to the ultimate reality that we will someday experience. How can we truly accept such an idea? How can we truly accept the idea 
that the world we're living in is not the real world. So dreams come to teach us that our perceptions of reality are not entirely reliable because they do seem so real to us. We go through a dream sometimes and it feels real. You all know the famous philosophical conundrum where the philosopher said, last night I dreamt that I was a butterfly. He says, how do I know now I'm not a butterfly dreaming on a human being? <laughs> it's hard to know what's real. So our dreams teach us about reality. And then once we realize this, when we realize what dreams are, we can truly wake up. The Talmud in Tractate Brachot 14a, Rav Zera says, anyone who goes for seven days without a dream is considered to be wicked. Famous statement in the Talmud, anyone who goes for seven days without a dream is considered to be wicked. The Vilna Gaon, the great Elijah of Vilna, explained very beautifully that during the weekdays, during our weekdays, we get very caught up in the mundane world. We're working, we're making a living, we're paying the bills, and we begin to think during those six days of the week, that's the real world. Our real world is all about making a living, paying the rent, buying food, driving to work, but on Shabbat, on the Sabbath, that illusion is shattered. Because on the Sabbath, we're not engaged with the physical world. We're not engaged with the mundane world. We disconnect from our blackberries. Mm -hmm. And we have the opportunity on the Shabbat to realize what is real living. And to realize on the Shabbat that it's the world of the spirit that is the real world, not the world of the six days of making a living. So the Vilna Gon explains that if you've gone for seven days, which includes a Shabbat, obviously, <coughs> if you've gone for seven days experiencing a Shabbat and you don't realize that this world is an illusion, <coughs> that this world is but a dream, that this world is not the real world, the Vilna Gon says something is terribly wrong. 